my name's Chris, and less than a year ago I became a Christian, and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And, and from the point that I had decided to make that commitment, much changes. Much changes for the better, and much changes as a result of a rough transitionary period that is bound towards better. I would say, as a person who has often tried to look back at my life and see where I've made mistakes, I've done that quite a bit more since coming to Christ. And aside from the point of this video, you find that God is a an all-intelligent dot connector, leading you to certain experiences, leading you to face certain challenges so that you may, you may find within yourself what it is you will need to overcome those, those adversities and experiences. So for me, wrath is my closely kept sin, I would say. And a lot of things have You know, you know, my anger, it's its not fully resolved. The thing about, the, the, the big uh, misconception about Christianity is that it's not a, it's not a prescription, it's not a pill, it's not something that you take or say that you have faith in, and then you're, you're, it's, it, it's quite a bit more work that goes into it from there. Um, and that's up to the person who believes to, to either put forth or not put forth the, the work to understand those things of God. But more importantly, it, I can only speak to the male experience in American culture, but men are facing a crisis of meaning, of belonging, and there's quite a bit of pressure placed upon young men in particular to get it all figured out. And it's tough for them because we're all living in a world that is, so much is being generated and put forth into the world. And everything becomes quite a bit faster. Things are being created more um, with higher quality, but at faster rates. And in all aspects, in terms of technology, uh, social events, social trends, there is a great amount of pressure on people in general to, to, to keep up with everything. And we as humans, we haven't really evolved, but what we have created has. And many times it outpaces us. But for men, this becomes um, an abysmal reality where a lot of them feel as though they're being left behind. They feel forgotten. And they feel like they have failed already with so much life ahead of them all because they haven't gotten every iota of how their life is supposed to be from that point to when they die, um, figured out. And many young men are coming to do reckless things. I continue to do reckless things as a, as a 32 year old man. Anger is quite a monster for me. It is a monster that if I don't face and face through and face it with what I've learned through Jesus Christ, that monster, um, it, uh, it, it attacks me with a, a sort of symbiosis and I become it. I become that monster. And you need to be careful. It doesn't take much for anger to destroy your life, to destroy your relationships. And from there, regret begins to set in. Regret, shame, guilt. And these are terrible things to feel, but they, they're necessary. Because when it comes to anger, anger will destroy you. Anger, it can get to such a point for you that it, it you, it, you are the one making your actions, saying your words, 
doing the nasty things you're doing through your anger, but it doesn't feel as though that you're in control. It's a terrifying feeling. It causes others to be terrified of you, which I've, I've caused to others. And so anyways, I did, I did make this video to, um, to share some of the, the wisdom that uh, the Word of God provides in terms of how to approach our anger. And hopefully, um, you know, I'd like to read some of these, maybe not all of them. Um, but they do provide a great deal of wisdom. And what I try to do, I, I fall short of it quite often. I try to wake up and read uh, a number of these each day. And I haven't, I haven't done it consistently. I've done it probably a handful of times and I've written all these down a couple of weeks ago. Um, so my consistency is quite poor. But those are things I seek to work on as well. But I, I have seen, I have caused um, the terrible results of anger that I couldn't get under control of soon enough before it caused damage. And for other young men out there, because I can only speak to that experience, but I mean, this does, this does too apply to just anybody, men, women, girls, boys, uh, adults, children, this, uh, God's word is for all of his children. And in, in all circumstances, his word is good and applicable. So I'd like to go ahead and just go through maybe a few of them. There's a few, there's uh, many in the Bible. Um, I've taken some from various books. And so the first one that I've written, it's from James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And this really, this really beats on the, the concept of patience. In moments of anger and frustration, we are often in a rush to say what we have to say. Because the anger is, is trying to push what we are trying to say out of us as fast as possible. And oftentimes you're not going to be interested in hearing what the other person has to say before you get a chance to speak because... Well, you're angry. You're angry and nothing is, is sensible. Everything is irrational. But at the same time, that monster inside you that has taken the helm has, is, is actively convincing you in real time that you are justified in what you're doing. So it's really, it's to me, I believe this verse speaks greatly to me, the virtue of patience. And... Be swift to hear. Be, be, be intently listening to what someone has to say. If what they have to say carries something precious that you ought to hear, then you ought to listen. Let someone fulfill what they have to say to you. Whether it's all bad, whether it's some of it's good, whether you don't feel like it's worth listening to, you may miss out on something that may very well help stop you from saying something that you may regret and that you can't take back. So, I believe that's a good way to look at that. That's from James chapter 1, that's verses 19 and 20. I have another one here, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27. Let not the sun, as in the sun and sky, not Jesus Christ, but, you know, the sun. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath neither give place to the devil. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What comes to my mind easily when I read that to not let the sun go down upon your wrath is whenever I might have a fight with my wife about something silly, about something ridiculous, something that I typically come to overblow and I, it's only later, you know, for, you know, if you're, if your anger and your frustrations are, are as, um, you know, childish and as like toxic as mine tend to be. Um, and I, I want to mention too, I'm not, I'm not describing my, my problems in any sort of way to garner pity. I want other people to know that they are not alone in, in how bad anger can become. 
Because I would often think, and I'm sorry to go off this, uh, the, the, the beaten path here, but I often think, like, look at the people out in society. They all look so well put together. I always looked angry. I always look angry. I always carry myself angrily. I always think angrily. And it's... And though I'm, I'm still um, a great deal of that person that I'm trying to work out of me, um, I find that I am... Only through Christ I have found myself to be less of that person, noticeably so, through Christ. Um, but... And then that shame sets in, and then I, I realize I acted like such a child that I'm going to continue to act like a child, and I'm not going to speak now. I'm going to shut down and be silent because I realize I said some things I shouldn't have said. I blew things out of proportion in a way that it was not necessary to. And, you know, now, for people that, you know, um, that put their partner through this particularly I'm, I'm speaking to the guys out there who put their wives through this because they have some sort of subtle narcissistic tendencies and behaviors within themselves that are just cause them to shut down they they believe like their shame the shame of how you acted so selfishly outweighs the fact that the person that you're not speaking to because of your outburst it outweighs how much they deserve you speaking to them and telling and assuring them that you made a mistake and to not let them think that it was them that made the mistake it was them something that they can't figure out unless you speak to them and that is a frustrating thing and that's not something that you want to put anybody through so because if you if you go to bed with your spouse and you decide to to, to leave things where they were it's just all this yelling and then it just it doesn't even taper doesn't even taper and our conversation proceeds it just it is screaming and then it just cuts off and ends you go your separate ways throughout the night you do things you you silently bitterly coldly are in accordance to try you know just doing things with one another with the, the most minimal amount of conversation and communication uh getting things done and it's it's quite it's it's awful you don't want to put um the people you love through that and when you go to bed and you do that, that nothing's resolved. That just because you slept, you both slept for you know a number of hours, and you wake up, that that wound that was caused the night previous hasn't cauterized. It's still bleeding. It's still oozing out. And communication, if anything, this speaks greatly to the to the to the point that communication is key in relationships. Uh, communication is key to resolving differences. Um, speech. The ability to speak and what we have and when we choose not when we're not even restricted from using when we choose not to use it it is an injustice unto ourselves and uh an injustice to whatever sort of relationship we're trying to maintain and now this doesn't just have to go for spouses for the um you know letting out the sun go down upon your wrath this is just for young men in general never never end your day angrily at least try not to and i know it's, it's hard Sometimes you don't, I get it. Sometimes you don't want to be anything but angry. You don't want to run to God to pray for, I mean, especially if you're, you know, you don't believe in God, you're not going to do that. But it, when I'm very angry, I, I won't pray. I'll just stew. I'll let it get worse. Even though that I, when I do pray, the Father is faithful. And he knows that I know that if I am to pray to him in this moment with my anger and knowing that I wish I could resolve this issue within myself and God knowing that he knows that I want that too and that he wants to be able to give that to me per my request of it from him, I still opt not to do it. Because when you do believe in God, when you truly believe in God, yes, you do want his forgiveness, you do want his love, but you feel immense shame bringing yourself to the Father. It doesn't even help to compare yourself to some of the most heinous people in the world that have asked for God's forgiveness and were given it. It's, 
And that's, that's a good sign that you are in fear of God, as in to be in awe of Him. And, um, but oftentimes I won't, because I'm just, I shamed myself in front of the Father. You know? Because in those moments, what I don't realize is that in my moments of my most worst anger are moments in which I'm practicing faithlessness. Because you're going to act like this knowing that in full view, God is watching you behave this way towards the people that he, he arranged for you to have in your life and to love. So that's Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. Um, this one's from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 to 18. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against his children, of thy, uh, against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And this is, um, you know, just a um, an elaboration of Love thy neighbor. Don't hold grudges. Uh, this can apply to uh, many situations. Complete strangers that piss us off and, and cause us to become irate in traffic or at the grocery store, they cut us in line. <coughs> Excuse me. Whatever. And me, I mean, listen, anger is, uh, for me, Anger is kind of like a charcuterie board, because it's like there's a, there's a whole assortment of different things. You have you know your anger, that's your broad spread, but then you got your grudges, you've got your assorted um, notions of vengeance and revenge that you want to exact onto people, and I things that things that you you carry in your head of people that said things that were maybe jokes you took too seriously, and then they just lived in your head, and then they just repeated over and over and over, and you you pulled sick paranoid meanings out of it that weren't there not necessarily but you, you ran with them and believed in them more than you had faith in anything else you know never mind god um so that is just to make your heart easy and find forgiveness for the the petty things that people do the things that they do to annoy it's not even like the, the terrible things that people do to intentionally try to hurt us just the 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 people that are within their own heads and up in the clouds and just you you, you know you can't uh don't burden yourself by thinking that the world and all of its people are out to get you because those thoughts and those things that you you think that you wish you want to do to those people um it is weight it is loud noise and it takes space it takes precious space um that which should be reserved for um, pondering God's word and, and deepening our understanding of him. And that is Leviticus 19, verses 17 to 18. This is Psalm 37, um, verses 8 and 9. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. And this is, um, you, I see this and there's so many times when I'm being, someone is trying to speak me down from my, my angry tirades, especially my wife. And God bless me with this woman who is completely honest with me in terms of like the person I am acting like in certain moments. And that, uh, that emotionally stunted part of myself that I still find myself dealing with doesn't want to accept that. And instead continues to be angry and continues to, to lash out. And it doesn't give the person that you're with much faith in in you when it when whenever it may come to a very tough unexpected dire situation people people invest a lot of hope 
Well, they, they invest a lot of, um, people weigh heavily how you behave. And not everybody's just thinking, wow, he, he's really angry, must be this, must be that. Some people are thinking, well, you know, in a, this type of situation, he may not fare too well because if this is a, his reaction, um, Find, find yourself cutting yourself off from anger and continuing to go down that path before it, it worsens. Um, listen to whatever voice is out there coming towards you, whether it's one in your head, the voice of God that's trying to tell you you need to calm down or so he will send someone to be in front of you. Like my wife often is in front of me telling me to calm down. Take that advice. Listen to it. And before before you groom your actions towards evil results and those evil results they once evil happens and the evil is outward and the evil is known it causes stagnation and pause because now you're left to ruminate with guilt and shame and dismal urgency within yourself to revise your character. Um, I'm going to try to get through these because it's... Whoa! How long is this video? 22 minutes. Wonderful. This is... One is from Proverbs 14, verse 29. Whoever is slow to anger, another one concerning um, one uh, who can maintain their patience has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exacts folly. Now we can go back to the other verse where uh, we had spoken about, um, you know, being swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, so one who has a hasty temper, it's, it's really the same thing. It goes back to that point of don't be so hasty as to get what you're saying out, what you need to say out, because no matter what, how hurtful or deranged or wrong it might sound, in our heads, it is important for us to say it. And it's very hard in moments of anger to parse between the words that shouldn't be said between the ones that should be said for the sake of moving the conversation forward. It's not hard for me to admit to those who I love because in order for you to get better and order for your relationships to get better with those you love, you need to admit your faults so that you can identify the problem and then identify what is going to remedy it. And it's like I said, those with hasty attitudes, we're just quick to get it out there. You miss out on perhaps the iota of wisdom, the small grain of wisdom that is necessary for you to hear so that you may come down from what can easily destroy you and just, because it will bring you, your sin brings you to the highest high. Anger is terrible, but it does feel like a high. You feel a sick sense of power when you're angry and getting a bunch of things off your chest, but doing it tyrannically. And once that it's brought you as high as it can and you've exhausted yourself, you just let go. And you come crashing to the ground. Don't let that happen to you. Do not exact folly against yourself. Because you found greater importance in saying what you felt had to be said. Instead of listening to the person that you're putting, um, you're putting through pain. Than what they had to say. And another one, similar Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. There is that, that, that thin, that thin coating, that protective enamel that is wiped away and, and sandblasted off, uh, um, what keeps, uh, placidity going into chaos and it can take just one word that that thin enamel is the matter of uh, uh, of one word that is like uh, a glass breaker um, 
and not even just a harsh word, but a harsh phrase, something harsh being said, a very blunt, concise, non-truth that is just meant to hurt and to wound and to put a stop to what is being talked about. Because for myself, whenever I have come to hurt someone with my words, it's because I wanted an end to this thing that you're trying to tell me about me, you're trying to tell me this about myself, you want me to work on this, I don't want that, I take that offensively, defensively, and in return I hurt you, in exchange for you trying to help me. But I don't want to see it as help, I want to, I want to be the little baby throwing a tantrum, wearing his crown, saying, I'm the king, and listen to me. I, I'm the one who feels bad, I'm the one who's being really loud right now, so I'm, I must be the one who's right. And it's, it's just an awful way to go about how that, that it's at that point you've just been taken away. You're likely going to be put through that entire, uh, the, enti the entirety of that circumstance playing out because you've committed to it after a certain point. So the sin is now dragging you through the stratosphere. You feel great. There's a, there's a, a dark sense of adrenaline that is overtaking you and now it has let you go because it's taking you as far as you, you were willing to take yourself. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And you know what that means when you're being let go and you drop down from sin and you feel that fall. That shame and that guilt that is necessary. Those who don't feel that are unconscious. Not with Christ. Not ashamed of themselves for what they did to someone else through how they acted. Imagine the power that a person has within themselves to hurt someone with something else other than their hands or blunt objects, inflicting physical pain. Because, don't be mistaken, emotional pain is accompanied by physical pain. Depression, knots in your stomach, nausea, being hurt through words does, does bring physical pain. And certainly in some circumstances, unfortunately, pain that we bring onto ourselves to distract from whatever it is that was said to us. Because sometimes it's so heinous, so gruesome, and so untrue, one does not know how to process it and, and come to terms with how it was said and... We have Proverbs 29, 22, chapter 29, verse 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. A man of wrath stirs up strife. You will make everything harder for everybody, not even yourself. Place yourself out of focus. Everyone who must live beneath your regimen of being angry and, and lashing out at others. Um, they walk on eggshells day by day, wondering when you're gonna blow up, knowing that it's gonna be at some point during the day. And everybody else just being on edge because they feel it coming. One given to anger causes much transgression. That's not just an excess of transgression within yourself. That is causing much transgression means to place your habits onto those who are watching you act that way. Like your children. Or anyone who Anyone who lives with you, especially children, um, if you walk around angry, exposing your children to anger, that's, that's how they believe the world's supposed to be gone about. And then you want to know what's worse than that. The type of guilt that comes with that. 
I, I often think so several times throughout the day. My kids will hate me. My kids won't want to talk to me. And, and But before any of that happens, they will live a, an angry life because of what I wasn't strong enough. hide from them what I wasn't strong enough to keep hidden so that they may maintain their happiness. I was always someone in my life. Before I met my wife, I was committed to never having kids. I never wanted them. I never wanted to get married either. And, but God, God knew from me that for me to have a wife and, and children is what I need in order to overcome certain things. But he also expects me, like, I am not just sending you these children so that you may learn, you may take out all your anger and keep being mad at them until you figure this out. Love them. Love them. And, and avoid doing to them what you felt was done to you. And I, I laid no blame on anybody for how I turned out or how I allowed myself to turn out. Because after a certain point, my life is my responsibility. But if, if at this point, I, and, I, and I don't change and I leave my children down that path and they live a similar life to the way I, the, the one I did growing up just being angry all the time not I would allow them every way to blame it on me Because I, I know, knowing what I know of God, I know that this is, this is mine to overcome for the sake of keeping together all that God has given me and wants me to keep. Keeping, you know, God, listen, and I'm sorry to talk from my point of view, God will not give you the great things in your life because he has hope or he has faith that you'll that you'll be the person that he made you to be he knows that you'll be the person he made you to be he's not he's not saying chris i'm going to give you children because i want to see if you can be a great father he knows i'm going to be a great father but he knows that i have to make all the right decisions in order to glorify that image that he has arranged for me. And so to also quell my anger so that I may make my children's lives easier so that they won't have to spend it being angry and frustrated, hiding questions from everybody because they're too scared to seek the answers. to that is a, is a quick one it's Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 it says fathers do not provoke your children to anger do not teach them who you are and then teach them vicariously that that's the sort of person that is walking around through the world regularly and being successful doing it Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. There's a few other ones here. I just want to, I want to read my favorite one. It's the one I always try to remind myself of. It's Proverbs 16, chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he 
that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. I'm going to take some time to break this one down a little bit. <laughs> he that is slow to anger is. Now in the Bible, the verse, as it's written, the word is, is italicized. <laughs> and to me, that means that through God, it is proof. If you maintain your tongue, if you keep the peace within yourself, you are better than the mighty. And the mighty, what can we look at as mighty? Kings, um, our enemies. But what's our greatest enemy? Sin. Sin is, it has might over us. And I might be wrong in interpreting this. It's... But sin is a mighty force. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Because once you have invited one sin in, you have opened the door for all sin to enter. And through wrath, much can be justified. Much can be justified from the come down to quell yourself, to comfort yourself, to satisfy the flesh, to forget how you had acted previously before you had found yourself fallen once more. is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. And he that ruleth his spirit, one who is abiding by Christ and keeping in Christ the edicts of his teachings and his lessons, better than he is, is it, it, as it's precisely written in the, in the KJV version. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. When you maintain yourself, when you are possessive of calm, you will detract your detractors' attempts to cause you to stumble. If you are meeting someone's anger with your own anger, thinking that it's a fire versus fight fire with fire type of thing, it's never the truth. Fighting fire with fire only makes the inferno bigger. Now, when you read it, it's, it's, it's written weird, strangely, as you would read it. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. So, as you should read that, it's he that ruleth his spirit, he that is abiding by Christ, is as well better than he who conquers a city and takes it over. Um, when you are working on yourself from the inside, and in moments where anger is free to escape and you've you've given it it's it's given much reason because in our pathways we quickly justify anger because it's a defense mechanism in a sense but when we maintain that and we display to our transgressor or whatever it is in front of us that's causing us to to lose it the grace within ourselves that causes us to stop being angry that which we are blessed with by god if we have the strength enough to ask for it in those moments in which it's the hardest to ask for it, we find that our thought processes, our thought processes easing, easing and and being able to think as we are meant to think with a something that is perhaps somewhat akin to a godlike clarity. I've been thinking quite a lot lately about how best can I begin spreading the word of God, and I think it's it's not through what I know best of the Bible, but what I know best of myself that the Bible speaks to. And, you know, to spend time with those parts of it and to digest them. And it's, it, you, you know... When you come to Christ, I would suggest that whatever it is that you deal with, um, you know, whatever you struggle with most in life, whatever your um, vice is, consult the Bible um, of its verses that relate to that particular problem and and dig into those. And I, I feel like that's a great point because you already have, you know, it's unfortunate, but we do have these relationships with our sin. I have a great relationship with anger. 
Um, even when I was younger, I can even remember when I would tell people, anger is my ally. You know, it, it keeps me safe and angry and I, you know, and it keeps people away from me. It was just an awful way to think. And it was really, it was truly motivated by isolation, um, being left to my own devices and being, confining myself to ethers of darkness that whispered to me and spoke to me terrible things that um, delayed me spiritually for many years. So this, um, in terms of anger, these are a few verses that uh, have helped me that I've, um, I, I try my best to, to go through and remember. And even doing this video, it brings up a, a lot of different things, a lot of different feelings. Um, but I know God is good and I, I feel the presence of Christ more strongly every day. But it is, it is on us to maintain our relationships with him because Christ is our friend and he wants to be our friend and he wants to better your friendship with you. And, but he wants you to better your friendship with him as well. He wants you to understand that it's, it's a road that you must travel along narrowly. As narrowly as is the pain that he suffered to, to give you what he's given all of us. So, thanks for listening. I know this was long. God bless.